It is known as the ultimate battle. Once a year, the creatures emerge from their caves and fight to establish superiority. Anything can be compromised. Flesh, hair, limbs, sanity, because this is the fight for survival. But not for wild animals. It's for the upperclassmen girls that go to my high school, who are basically wild animals. My high school has a lot of really weird traditions, one of them being powder puff, where the senior and junior girls fight each other in what is officially considered female football. Here are the rules. Yeah, there are no rules. It's basically a giant cat fight, and there may or may not be a football on the field. <laughs> One year, a knife was pulled. Another year, girls filled water guns with deer urine to squirt at the other team. Which begs the question, where did they get deer urine? <laughs> But these otherwise sane girls quite literally tackle and drop kick each other because, well, they're supposed to hate each other. It's us against them. And this outlook on life isn't just something the girls at my high school share. Today, it seems that we have grown increasingly inclined to separate and disconnect ourselves from people who we see as the other, as them. Eric Klein, author of the book The Crystal Stair, defines this concept, known as otherization, to be the action of turning another person or group into an alien other, into a thing. And when we live our lives believing the world is separated into the people who are like us and the people who are like them, we turn off our ability to be tolerant, compassionate, and even empathetic. So let's corner the problem, duke it out with the impacts, and finally shake hands as we find our solutions. Now, I didn't actually play in the powder puff game at my school because the other girls were intimidated by my amazing athletic prowess. But to a certain degree, our tendency to otherize is hardwired into our brains. J. Van Bavel, leader of NYU's Social Perception Lab, designed an experiment to show just how prone we are to this us versus them thinking. He simply told his participants they were on the red team or the blue team. That was all it took. Instantly, red team members were more compassionate and empathetic towards fellow teammates and became unable to sympathize with their opponents, taking pleasure in the blue team's pain. Pretty troubling. And it's even more troubling that these red teams and blue teams are so ingrained in our culture. It's why violence explodes between the protesters and the police. It's why the liberals and conservatives in Congress can't get anything done. And it's why the orators, like us, would never date an extemper. <laughs> However, our incessant need to otherize can be much more detrimental and, frankly, can make us look pretty stupid. After the recent attack on satirical newspaper Charlie Hebdo, the international community immediately started to blame all Muslims for the actions of a few. In an in-depth, well-researched, and perfectly rational tweet, the already infamous newspaper tycoon Rupert Murdoch epitomized this problem when he tweeted that all Muslims must be held responsible to destroy their growing jihadist cancer. Now, the Twitter sphere had some questions about this. Muslim comedian Aziz Ansari tweeted back at Murdoch, asking, how, specifically, can my 60-year-old parents living in North Carolina help destroy terrorist groups? 
please advise. <laughs> and the Twitter war intensified when J.K. Rowling tweeted, Murdoch and I are both Christian. And if that makes him my responsibility, I'll auto excommunicate. <laughs> it was the great Twitter war of 2015. So many people posted so many dumb things. <laughs> Speaking of which, how about that Nats 15 app activity feed? <laughs> But the point is simple. It is dangerous and problematic to use sweeping generalizations that otherwise 1.7 billion diverse and multifaceted people. As journalist Nicholas Kristof writes, the great divide is not between faiths. Rather, it is between those who are tolerant and those who otherize. Now certainly, Powder Puff Football, and all sports for that matter, encourage the marginalization of others. By the way, quick shout out to my Golden State Warriors. Sorry, but Indians just love curry. But as Rutgers University professor Stephen Handel explains, when we otherize, in sports, in politics, and in life. We risk turning off the neural pathways that allow us to appreciate and sympathize with others. And this enables atrocities to happen in our own backyards. On April 4th, 2015, the Texas legislature met to discuss transgender rights in their home state. Among many pieces of legislation heard that day, one, simply allowed a transgendered person to use the restroom of their own gender identity. Now, while this issue is certainly a sensitive one that requires thoughtful conversation, the dialogue at the hearing was destructive and otherizing. When a group of transgenders stood at the podium to introduce the bill, audience members called them perverts, creeps, and threats to society. Komen O'Rolly, one of the transgenders who spoke on the bill said the most disconcerting thing to happen was hearing myself called it and that. It was gut-wrenching. Right here in Dallas, Texas, one of the most marginalized and at-risk group of people were further victimized by a group of adults for being who they are. And we have seen this before with the Nazis and the Jews, the Sunnis and the Shiites, the Hutus and the Tutsis, and we even see it today in our own homes, in my home. I have grown up surrounded by a unique culture. Indian tradition calls for strict social classes, separating the rich from the poor, the religious from the non-religious, the males from the females, and my family bore victim to this. My dad was from India's top social class. He was wealthy and powerful, but my mom ranked lower on the social hierarchy. So when my parents decided to get married, the feelings you'd expect from your family, those of pride and joy, were replaced with rejection and anger. And for years after my parents' marriage, their immediate families grew apart instead of together, based on the single belief that they were too different. It was us against them. Then my parents' first child came along. When I was born, the barrier that separated my mom's and my dad's families seemed to disappear, because when they were encouraged to come together, they found a common ground. Me. And that's why my parents named me Ekta. In Sanskrit, a native Indian language, it means unity and oneness. A gift that, without even knowing, I was able to give to my family. True unity 
doesn't come from separating ourselves from others. It comes from finding authentic ways to connect. And there are several things we can all do to play on the same team. First, we need to strip different of its negative connotation. Elizabeth Lesser, in her TED Talk, Take the Other to Lunch, says that while we may have differences, those can become the basis for dialogue. This concept is being adopted nationwide. Recently, many colleges, including the University of Texas at Dallas, have embraced a new campus network called Sustained Dialogues, which trains young leaders to facilitate discussion about difference amongst their peers. This is a model we can all emulate in our lives. Instead of viewing difference as a barrier, we can view it as a beginning to relationship. And second, we need to find similarities in the other. Fortunately, we have neuroscience on our side. Journalist Brian Resnick writes that the same cognitive process that make it easy to turn people against one another can also be harnessed to bring them together. In other words, the same mental process my family used to justify class divides, the same mental process the red team used to otherize the blue team was the very same mental process they used to come together. Once they realized their similarities were more important than their differences. After all, even the two most different people on this planet share 99.9% of the same DNA. We aren't on the red team or the blue team. We are on team humanity. Now I realize that redefining the way we think about our relationships with other people isn't something that's going to happen overnight, especially for the girls that play powder puff at my high school. But I am seeing slow improvements. This year, they fortunately didn't fill their water guns with deer urine. Instead, they filled them with lemonade, which they said was deer urine. <laughs> However, it's time we break down the barriers that separate us and them, and it will not be easy. But only when we join a team we can all fight on will we really understand what it means to be united. So, welcome to Team Humanity. <laughs>